Hello, uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, first, uh, test your uh, earphones. Does it work? Is everything okay? So, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to be here with you. Uh, my name is Yelena, Elena. Uh, I'm a full professor of pediatrics. Uh, I'm involved in pediatric pathology. And the topic proposed for today uh, is uh, biomarkers to predict outcome in JA. Uh, the biomarker is uh, something uh, that has a characteristic that can objectively measure and uh, uh, evaluate and serve you as an indicator of some physiological process, um, then some pathogenic process like CRP inflammation, or some response to the treatment interventions. So because of that, we are uh, uh, obviously recognizing two types of uh, biomarkers. Prognostic biomarkers, they can help you to predict the progress of the disease regardless of the treatment, and this is a prognostic biomarker, or you can recognize so-called predictive biomarkers. Those are the biomarker markers that can uh, help you to predict the response to the treatment. Uh, both of them are very important and to something to become a biomarker must be tested in very specific and hard way and must pro uh, have proven sensitivity and specificity to provide you information. So the ability to predict disease outcomes means that biomarker will show you what is the outcome to come. The easiest way to uh, explain this is when you see uh, green, uh, this type of green grass in my country and in many others, we believe it will bring us luck. When you see a black cat, you expect as a biomarker that that will be a bad luck. In medicine, hypertension is a biomarker for cardiovascular events and so on. T score, for example, for bone fracture, uh, ACTA antibodies, uh, meaning seropositivity and poor prognostic factor for structural, stru structural damage, which is very well known in adults with rheumatoid arthritis, but as well in our uh, patients when they are uh, seropositive uh, for uh, rheumatoid factor and sometimes uh, for ACTA. So, meaning, uh, okay? So, this is uh, the concept uh, of uh, biomarkers. And uh, the most important issue is that uh, can biomarker predict the response for treatment? This is why we are needed them for mostly. So what does it mean that the one biomarker can you lead to predict the response? In ideal circumstances, when you have some group or a bunch of markers, biomarkers, then uh, when you combine them, uh, that should allow you if that uh, you can in a uh, different mixed uh, group of patients uh, anal analyze the uh, predictive value of the present biomarkers in each specific patient. Then to put some algorithm of how does it improve uh, influence on the outcome, and then to make a real choice, meaning to make a right decision on the treatment, what treatment should be implied. Should it be the treatment type 1, type 2, or 3? In real life, in our setting is, which medication should I choose to be the best medication for this specific patient, uh, may, uh, being, making me sure that I uh, made a good decision. So, when we say biomarkers, it's not uh, so simple. And usually when you say biomarkers, most of us think it's only laboratory biomarkers. But it's not really true. Biomarker is actually bio because uh, you are doing something on your patient, meaning the human. But it's not necessarily only laboratory uh, that you can use as a biomarker. So biomarkers are yeah, all the items you use as a clinical disease activity or outcome measures. Then uh, there is a possibility to use imaging modalities as a biomarker, and uh, then laboratory markers as a biomarker, classical as you know. So how clinical diseases activity can be a biomarker? You are probably familiar about the new outcome measures uh, we implement in the, the diagnosis, uh, follow-up, and treatment of JA, which is a YADA score, which is much more simple and much more close to the DAS28, which is used in adults, meaning that you can follow up the patient even when it becomes adult. Uh, so, 
we uh, there was a huge work done to have a specificity of this uh, measure to be used. Then we had the specific uh, cutoff values. So we, by the values we recalculate when we examine the patient in the joint, uh, we know uh, what is the disease activity if the patient has oligoarticular or polyarticular cord. So it's not just enough to have uh, um, uh, this cord as a disease activity. You need as uh, this uh, disease activity measure as one of the bi biomarkers to uh, estimate uh, if your disease is in a low diseasity, minimal disease activity, or in a remission, which should help you and lead you to make uh, uh, treatment decisions. Last year, uh, we had a huge OMRAD uh, meeting, uh, since I'm coaching one of the several OMRAD groups, but one is on a JA course set. We did in depth analysis uh, in a very far away territory in Australia, and uh, it is just published in general rheumatology what our group and the OMRAP is a call, uh, and OMRAP is the outcome measures in rheumatology proposed to be the new uh, uh, outcome tools that should be used in JEA instead of ACR 2057 response that were used. So you will notice that laboratory signs of inflammation and imaging signs of, signs of inflammation are going to be in, included as an outcome measure, of course, because they have a value of the biomarkers. So what does it mean? When you examine your patient, you uh, get yourself now and by the age, uh, the sex, meaning female or, or male, the joints that are affected, uh, what type of joints, uh, number of joints. You can already use your clinical uh, examination and anamnestic data you obtain as a biomarker to help you to do the good diagnosis and uh, to estimate the subtype of disease. Subtype of JA is very important because for each subtype you have a different algorithm for the treatment you should commence. Very fast, I will go through the imaging modalities that we are implementing and work on and what we have done to use the imaging modality as a biomarker. You are all aware that you can use MRI, uh, ultrasound or classic X-ray. But X-ray uh, capture very late changes, meaning uh, on X-ray you will notice that something is going on when there is a structural damage, which is really terrible, so you cannot do nothing. So that is why uh, as a human press uh, group, we published uh, two or three years ago a recommendation for the usage of imaging for diagnosis, follow-up and treatment uh, follow-up in JA. Patients strongly recommend you uh, to use this publication. Of course, there is more and more of us uh, focused on ultrasound. Why? Because it's a very easy, reliable uh, method. Uh, kids are uh, liking it. Uh, you can do a several examination, you can examine all your joints, and when you do your clinical examination, if you're not sure, and in children usually are not so sure if there is arthritis or not, so uh, ultrasound is a very helpful tool to uh, put your probe and pick inside the joint to be sure if there is some sinusitis or not. Uh, so several studies have proved the clinical examination is not sensitive enough as a biomarker, uh, to be sure of how many joints are active at the moment, but when you do the ultrasound, then you can capture much more joints, and this is so important that even in two thirds of patients, you it would change their diagnosis and classify them as having, for example, polyarticular disease and not oligoarticular, as you uh, had an impression when you did clinical examination. We did the total literature, literature review and uh, in uh, found evidences this ultrasound has a base and content validity for detecting sinusitis in JA, have very high sensitivity as compared to clinical examination, same as MRI, and that we must do uh, very uh, deep studies to standardize technique because it's a very subjective. So we did the uh, standardization studies we uh, established where the probe should be and, and everything for each joint, separate joint. Then uh, we uh, uh, moved to uh, provide the 
um, the definitions for the sonographic features of synovitis in children, and obviously, unfortunately, I cannot show it to you, but this is how looks the joint with the synovitis, and diagnosis of synovitis when you put a probe uh, can be made uh, using the grayscale because you can see increased amount of synovial fluid or synovial repetitive. So this is an example of how does it looks, but additional information you get is if you activate Doppler, then you will get in, uh, you will have an impression of the vascularization. We are all aware that inflammation always means increased vascularization. So if the changes you saw uh, on the grayscale are really active or it's a panus or uh, and not active joint. So then we move to make a grading of this. Uh, and provided, and we are working to publish hopefully until the end of this year, the definition for grading intensity of synovitis for each joint and make a score of this. Grading is, is a grade 0, uh, 1 to 3, mild, moderate, or severe, if you use a grayscale, or if you use uh, Doppler as an additional technique providing you information about the level of inflammation in each. Uh, specific joint you are interested in. So, uh, based on the experience that came from adults, we are treated uh, from, from, with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, uh, what is uh, very important is that we must prove that ultrasound as a biomarker tool that will be implemented in all joints, like a clinical examination, should have ability to predict the response uh, to treatment or to the predictor labs of the JA. And recent study, I uh, was a reviewer of it, it's a very nice study coming from the group from Italy, from Italy, published in hours of rheumatic diseases, have been uh, proven that uh, if you implement the ultrasound, then you can uh, predict if that patient will relapse or not. So biomarkers are the most important for prediction so makes you ability to know uh, what will be the future of that specific patient and should you uh, increase the treatment you, you are commencing. Then, uh, laboratory biomarkers, those are the ones that you are uh, mostly uh, thinking of when we mention biomarkers. Of course, there are uh, so-called diagnostic biomarkers and some prognostic biomarkers. Unfortunately, in JA, there, there is no uh, possibility to not to get any diagnostic biomarker because uh, neither of them get sensitivity or specificity, specificity, but as a prognostic biomarkers or to show you the level of inflammation, uh, you can use a several proposed biomarkers. One of them are so more called as under proteins, and I will not explain because uh, uh, lectures to come are going to focus uh, in more details on that. But uh, what is very important to know that those inflammation like markers, S100 proteins, MRP814, uh, S12, however, can be proven to be more uh, specific and sensitive than C reactive protein in the state of inflammation. This is especially important when you have a systemic JA patient in whom you have a high CRP level, so you do not know is it an infection or is it just an inflammation. So these uh, biomarkers can help you uh, to make a difference because it is shown they are inactive systemic JA, they are 44 times higher than, for, for example, in a healthy, and uh, six times higher than in patients with infection. It is important that the same inflammatory biomarkers uh, belonging to MRP family or S100 family uh, can be shown uh, to correlate to the level of YADAS, meaning the YADAS score, the number of active joints, the CRP level and ESR in JA patients, that uh, they are highly sensitive and can serve uh, as a biomarker to predict if patient will be able to maintain the remission in JA. And then uh, recently published in General Rheumatology, uh, very interesting studies from the group who is dealing with this biomarker, uh, they did a study and uh, found out that responders to methotrexate or anti-TNF can be identified by higher pretreatment S100 A12 serum concentration level, which is very important uh, to provide you biomarker to have a predictive value. So then you can know should this will this patient will respond to methotrexate or anti-TNF treatment. However. 
many of these uh, accumulate through the time uh, uh, of this knowledge, and especially in adults with rheumatoid arthritis, because the uh, number of biomarkers laboratory are growing, they pick the most important and more sensitive biomarkers, making them 10 of them, uh, and combine them with the scoring of the, the joint count uh, on the clinical examination, and they make MDPA score, where I made as a uh, specific score, and what they did, then they implement this score, clinical examination plus a uh, group of specific biomarkers, and then the ultrasound examination, and all three group of biomarkers were used uh, to test the sensitivity of prediction and have found that uh, there is a, a, a very nice and good correlation of uh, all three types of biomarkers and they can predict a uh, response to biologic treatment in adults with rheumatoid arthritis. According to this, and analyzing all data on biomarkers that are present and going around in JA group at the moment, is uh, carrying out the four realm, your project, uh, that should be more or less the same, uh, testing the bunch of, uh, uh, the group of uh, soluble laboratory biomarkers in combination with the others, as a clinical examination to biomarker tool, and with um, uh, ultrasound using the scoring system, and that's why recently uh, in the editorial of General Rheumatology we proposed that this type of multi-biomarker panel should help us uh, to um, um, predict the uh, outcome and make uh, us much more uh, better in uh, uh, choosing the treatment options. So, all of this story, the main question when you are sitting there is, uh, there is so many things, but what is the implication for my everyday uh, clinical work and how this influences the treatment strategy I'm uh, going to use. So, JA is a classic inflammatory disease and most of the inflammation is going on very early in the disease onset. So there is a window of opportunity which is very, very early before uh, the, you notice the first symptoms of the disease. When you have a symptoms, already a lot of inflammation can be done and slowly you are losing this clinical opportunity. When you have established disease, then you have a clinical manifestation and that's the problem and that is mainly why ultrasound and imaging plus biomarkers mainly help us to go much more earlier with diagnosis. The ideal approach is so-called treat-to-target approach, meaning that you should suspect the specific JA subtype as soon as possible, and then uh, to use so-called uh, uh, optimal step-down treatment approach instead of uh, all-time uh, slow step-up approach, meaning that when you suspect, uh, then you should implement early aggressive treatment to stop the inflammation because it was proven this is the most efficacious way for you to achieve remission and avoid any further damage to your patient. Uh, there are uh, so many different medications which are available at the moment, uh, different biologics and so on, uh, blockers of one DNA, blockers of one six, blockers of one function and so on. So uh, the question arises, which medication should I choose for my specific patient? This is the crucial uh, question for any of us who are clinicians and we face parents and face the child in front of us. So how, how can, can I have a clue on this? So how can you, maybe I can give you an advice, how can you have a clue? Uh, is if you look in your anamnestic data and clinical examination, it are some so-called biomarkers to help you to uh, uh, first differentially diagnose if patient is oligo or polyarticular, uh, to check always use uh, imaging because sometimes it's a polyarticular disease even though you do not see. The specific one of the group of JAs is so-called oligoarticular one, and among the oligoarticulars, you can uh, differentiate two types, subtypes, uh, main subtypes of patients. One is uh, so-called small girls with oligoarthritis, which are very frequently NAA positive, and they have uh, a biomarker. NAA is a very good biomarker that maybe lead them to develop. Uh, eye disease, meaning uveitis. 
and care much more poor outcome. But there is the other half of the patient that will um, have extended oligo uh, course of disease, meaning they will become a polyarticular disease. So the classic algorithm of the treatment is, as you know, uh, but what you should have in mind is that if you have biomarkers, uh, one biomarker which is NAA positivity in a very, very young girl presenting as oligo, probably, uh, uh, for, uh, meaning for sure, you should go uh, for uh, the prevention or treatment uh, of the uveitis, meaning go very fast for an optimal dose of methotrexate, then you will, uh, as a TNF, you should pick for uh, adalimumab because it is uh, very nicely proven that uh, in this subgroup of the patient, small girl, NAA positive, oligo, uh, uh, this treatment will be very important. So NAA positivity is uh, the very nice example of biomarker to differentiate one subtype of patient. On the other hand, if in the same branch, if the patient was not NAA positive, uh, has an extended oligo, through the time this uh, extended oligo will actually become a polyarticular JA patient and you still want to follow so-called trick to target strategy in the patient who is polyarticular uh, then you should commence the polyarticular treatment algorithm, meaning that it's not necessary to follow MTX, methotrexate, flu plus adalimumab. Uh, but you, what you should do, you should monitor the inflammation markers and other biomarkers to estimate if this is a JA with a high inflammation, and how do you know that there is a high inflammation? Usually those are the patients with uh, increased DSR, with uh, increased CRP, with thrombocytosis, with anemia, and so on. So there is some inflammation huge going on. So your treatment strategy uh, should be changed, and maybe you should ask for a, a role for a different mechanism of action. Uh, this, this is specifically important for the patients who have, from the beginning, polyarticular um, disease uh, course, and there you distinguish rheumatoid factor positive, which are small percentage, 5 to 10 percent, usually adolescents, and rheumatoid factor negative polyarticular patients, who from the beginning had uh, uh, quite a, a numerous uh, joint uh, involvement, meaning more than five joints. Even in these uh, types, it is clear that uh, rheumatoid factor positive uh, polyarticular JI patients are actually early uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients, and then you should implement the treatment strategy that is used for adults, meaning uh, it's a seropositivity, and probably you, there, you, in some types of treatment you are going to need blockade of IL-6 or some other mechanism, not always the anti tnf uh, however, here there is a small percentage of them which can be NAA positive, then the algorithm is different. So, in polyarticular patients, you must estimate uh, how many joints are involved, uh, what are the poor prognostic factors, uh, is there ongoing inflammation, is there a seropositivity, uh, then what is the imaging finding and the or especially if there is inflammation going on. And if this is the case, then uh, it is questionable should you go for anti-TNF or if you go for, uh, for anti-TNF is the first choice, uh, give to it uh, according to treat to target strategy three to six months uh, to have an effect. If they are not uh, bringing you a patient to remission, then you should change for usually for a different mechanism of action, blocking IL-6, which is possible in JEA since uh, others are not registered. A separate subtype group is systemic JEA patients in dolent patients. Most of inflammatory biomarkers laboratory are increased, but it is from clinical point of view very important to distinguish those with systemic features and without arthritis in many cases, and those with arthritis and without systemic features. So biomarkers are very important to distinguish two of them, as well as clinical manifestations. 
So the guidelines published for the treatment of uh, one or the other subtype uh, are quite clear, and they put in focus that in systemic JA, that there are two specific biologics you should go on. If it's an early uh, systemic disease with active systemic features, probably blocking IL-1 early in the onset of diagnosis should be the best choice. But unfortunately, it's not always available because it's not registered or too expensive, however. But the, the second medication that is uh, proposed and recommended is blocking IL-6. That's because the mechanism, uh, even a pathogenesis of, of systemic JA is completely different than other JA subtypes. So the target uh, cytokines you want to block are IL-1 and IL-6. And you then can achieve the best results. This considers uh, in, for patients uh, with systemic uh, uh, features, but even for the patients who are not anymore with the systemic features, but they can uh, join the disease only. Why? Because it's a clear evidence coming from the Viter registry who has analyzed usage of IL-1 blocker, TNF blockers, and IL-6 blockers in patients with systemic JA and clearly demonstrate that it, um, irregardless uh, if um, uh, there is um, active systemic features or not active, active systemic features, the best response, uh, meaning the uh, Yadas remission, the Yadas minimal disease activity, and ACR inactive disease was achieved if uh, IL-6 blocker was used uh, as a treatment option for this uh, sub-type uh, of JA, which is very important to know, because officially the recommendations uh, they say you could go for anti-DNF if there is only joint manifestation. Probably uh, you can try, but do not expect too much, especially if uh, there is inflammation going on. On the other story, the key message for you I wanted to deliver today is that biomarkers can guide your clinical strategy. They can help you uh, to uh, categorize your patient as soon as, as early as possible in which <coughs> subtypes it belongs. Then, according to the present uh, laboratory biomarkers and the level of inflammation, measuring ESR, CRP, MRP, uh, 814, or S812, uh, um, NAA positivity or negativity, age of patient, sex of patient, you can very nicely. Uh, Pick your best treatment strategy according to the evidence provided from the registries. So, uh, hopefully, this uh, lecture should help you to become a wizard and can, uh, and can predict the future for each of your individual patients and maybe uh, make you to start thinking that you should think very thoroughly you know, accounting all these details when you examine each specific patient before you make some specific treatment approach. Thank you for your attention and there are the, the pictures.